welcome to the Indomitable Podcast. I'm your host, Dai Cerullo, and today we have another great episode that will leave you inspired. My guest today is the Indomitable Wendella Whitcomb Marsh. Wendella Whitcomb Marsh is an award-winning author, a sought-after speaker, and an autism expert specializing in late-diagnosed autism. She is the founder and CEO of Adult Autism Assessment Services, a neurodiversity affirming group practice providing assessment for autism and ADHD counseling and life coaching nationwide. Her books include Recognizing Autism in Women and Girls and the series Adulting While Autistic. Wow. Well, hello, Wendy. I am so grateful to have you here today. Well, hi, Di. It is wonderful to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Okay, so I would love it if you could share a little bit about yourself to those who are listening that I potentially left out. I'll kind of make it short. I First, I grew up <laughs> for about 20 years. And then for uh, another 20 years, I was a special education teacher. Um, mm -hmm. And I loved that. And then for another 20 years, I went back to school and I became a, a school psychologist and then a licensed educational psychologist, a behavior analyst. Um, although I've never done uh, ABA applied behavior analysis with people. Mm -hmm. I just love the study of human behavior because behaving is peopling and I love people. Yes. So, so yes. that was an interest of mine. Um, Same. And uh, then I, after I got all the letters after my name, I, oh, I got a religious studies doctorate in pastoral counseling with an emphasis on counseling with the people affected by autism. Oh, that's really now, cool. Oh, thanks. I had um, I had been working with children with autism for years before I realized I was living with autistic people. My late husband, mm. two of our three children, now grown, were all late diagnosed autistic. It took a while mm. for me to get on board and catch on because um, they just looked very different from the toddlers that I had been working with um, mm. because it is such a broad spectrum. It includes so many different kinds of people. Um, mm -hmm. now at one point, well, back in 2009, uh, my, my husband did have a heart attack and die suddenly when he was uh, 54. So as a so family, sorry. we had to, yeah. And that's when you find out, uh, how to be indomitable. You know, if you never knew you were when tragedy hits, mm -hmm. you just have to do what you have to do. So we pulled together as so a little, true. you know, went from a family of five to a family of four, um, mm -hmm. supported each other. Uh, and you know, work is for me, work was great because I could go and focus on other people and what I could yes. do to help them. Um, yes. and you know, that was 2009 and now, mm -hmm. uh, in 2024, I'm at that place. It's hard to even describe how hard it is to lose someone that you're so close to, but everybody experiences it at some point. It's part of our right. human things that we have in common. But yeah. I can say so many years later that now I can think about David and just remember the good things and I can mm. smile or laugh or just have fun thinking about him without that knife in the heart of, right. and now he's gone because we had, you know, there was a time in our lives when we were not, didn't know each other. There was a time mm. in our lives when we were together and we were married. And then there's a time in our lives after that time. And looking mm. back from afar, you can say this was the way it was supposed to be. We yeah. wanted more time together, uh, yeah. but we didn't have it. But there right. does come a point where there is that acceptance and the, you know, now we just do what we can. So after, when I got to that point of, it's okay, I, you know, I am, it's not that I was myself again, because I had to be somebody mm. different, but I right. had but I, I had a sense of self again. You know, I pieced myself back together. Yes. yes. So I took, uh, I took early retirement and mm. I moved with my three kids and two cats from California to Oregon, where I have two sisters living. Um, mm. And, you know, that was a hard move. And I, I feel like I never want to move again. But we did it. Yes. Yes. Um, and, you know, you just, you just do what mm. you have to do. And you may not always do things perfectly. That move was not perfect, but no. we survived it. So mm. I got to Oregon and I was retired. So I didn't have yeah. to do stuff. I thought, you know, I might write a book. I come from a big yeah. family of writers. It's like everybody in my family was a writer except me. I mean, I, I would write <laughs> work. Um, but I thought, you know, maybe I'll write a book and maybe I'll see one or two 
private clients um, for consultation yeah. you know, about autism. Right. So what has transpired between 2016 and now, especially after the pandemic? Yes. Many especially. people, you know, we were all deeply affected by that and the whole, the changes. Yes. Um, and more mm -hmm. and more people were coming to me saying, I think I'm autistic. You know, is that possible? Because I, I was never identified as a child. And as you know, you don't have to be identified with whatever your neurodivergence is. No, in childhood. no. People learn how to mask. Yes. So, yeah. so many yes. people. Yes. The, the masking, um, is it becomes second nature. You know, they might start mm -hmm. in childhood. Uh, but there were mm -hmm. so many. I could not. Uh, I, I needed to hire people. I needed to have a team of people who were licensed in many different states. Um, to do yeah. the full uh, assessment and uh, diagnosis. Yeah, Most of to my, meet the needs. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. The need was there. Um, and mm -hmm. it, it would break my heart to hear stories like, well, I went to a neurologist and he said, all the tests showed that you're autistic, but I'm not going to give you the diagnosis because you have a job and you're married. Like, Excuse me? <laughs> Or because you looked at me, you know, you made eye contact. But did you ask how mm -hmm. hard was it for me to make eye contact? Mm -hmm. Did I teach mm. myself as a teenager that, oh, people expect this. I'd better have a system for looking at people's eyes. Yes. And, yes. yes. And so many oh, professionals yeah. did not know how to look behind the mask. So Absolutely. if people were really, really good at it, that meant they would get no surfaces because they couldn't be recognized. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Most of the people I've hired as my clinicians um, are themselves neurodivergent. Most of them are autistic. Um, mm -hmm. because they get it, you know. Yes. And, yes. And also, it can be hard for an autistic person to work with a whole bunch of neurotypical people and mm -hmm. to feel like you have a mask at work. Like you can't. Oh, my God. Yes. A staff meeting or something. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. I just wanted to have that kind of place where the kind of people that I love to hang out with, because, you know, I'm married an autistic man because I, mm -hmm. I appreciate the diversity of the brains. <laughs> yes. Um, so, yes, so neurodivergent people have a tendency to travel in packs for sure. Yeah. Yes, they find their people. And once mm -hmm. they find their people, um, then life is better. Life is better. <laughs> but for yeah, so absolutely. So many not knowing that they're really autistic can hold them back from finding their people because they feel like, I don't really belong. We yes. share so much in common, yes. but I don't yes. have that label. So yes. I really want to for people to get the appropriate label, you know, not that we all have yes. to be labeled. But you know you I belong agree. with a group when you have that diagnosis. So I was diagnosed ADHD when I was a child because I grew up in foster care. That was my experience. I educated the people around me about ADHD. What I was constantly sort of fighting against is what you were just talking about, that outsider perspective and that outsider awareness of what um, neurodiversity looks like. So mm -hmm. It has always been my belief that the very, let's say like in the 90s and the early 2000s, perhaps, that um, our community was very much defined by the outsider perspective, right? I got a lot of feedback as a child that I wasn't living up to my potential and that, of course, I didn't really have ADHD because only boys have ADHD. Of course, I didn't really have ADHD because my I could I could sit still and I made eye contact. And why did I you know, why was I making why did I need to label myself and all of those things? Right. That feedback that we all constantly get that is always so informed by outsiders and outside perspective. So mm -hmm. what do you that being said? Since that seems to be everybody, regardless of when they were diagnosed, initial experience with their neurodiversity, what would you say is the most common misconception about neurodiversity? Well, or I a think, few, if you've got a few. <laughs> okay, you, you have mentioned one in particular is that it's mostly boys. And right, what I found right. is, yeah, now back when I first started teaching in the 70s, uh, autism yes. is like one in 10,000. It's like, you're never going to have yeah. a student in your class who's autistic. Right. Well, I probably right. had a lot of them, but they had different labels. That's right. They weren't recognized. That's right. That's right. The DSM. Yeah. The diagnostic statistics manual that we use to make a diagnosis 
way mm-hmm. back, um, it, the description of autism included what they used to call mental retardation and we now call intellectual disability. You could not mm-hmm. be called autistic if you were smart. Well, right. of course, we realize now right? there are very smart people who are very autistic. Very smart people. <laughs> yes. Yes. Very. But. Even after they took it out of the DSM, the general idea about what autism means had that, mm-hmm. like people carried that that belief, that myth, that Absolutely. if you were smart, you couldn't be autistic. And uh, the belief has mm-hmm. been four out of five are going to be boys and maybe more. So mm-hmm. when they made tests for yeah. autism, they would norm it on a population that was four to five, four out of five males. Yes. So the test mm-hmm. was kind of skewed to males because they, and I know they thought mm-hmm. they were doing it right because they thought that was true, but girls and women right. look different. Right. Um, yes. A, yes. A little boy, you know, who flaps his hands, people might say, oh, that looks kind of autistic. A little girl, they might mm. say, well, she's, she's, her fingers are butterflies. If she spins around, oh, she's yeah. <laughs> These are her thinking fingers. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and sometimes they they do because girls are better at um uh, observing and imitating other people so yeah. maybe they were flapping their hands when they were mm-hmm. in preschool then they get to kindergarten and they get feedback like oh nobody else is doing this yes Here are yes all these they become like a little anthropologist on the playground observing and learning so they can mm-hmm. move among these creatures as if they were one yes. of them and that feeling yes. of not being one of them is deeply mm-hmm. entrenched. It's like, I do yes. not understand these people. Right. Um, right. One of my kids once described uh, the, the experience of uh, that other people become a group. Other kids become a group by proximity. They become yes. friends by proximity. And that she right. did not know how to right. do that. It's not oh, required yeah. in the DSM that. Right. Autistic people cannot make eye contact. That's one characteristic right. of many that you just have to have a certain number, but you don't have mm-hmm. to have that be an issue. For yes. most autistic people, it's uncomfortable for them. Yes, um, absolutely. Or, or painful. Mm-hmm. But many have taught themselves or they have a system. Uh, you know, some yes. say, you know, uh, my, my standard operating procedure is I look at the eyes for three seconds. I glance away two seconds. I look back for four seconds. And in their head, they're counting while they're carrying on a conversation. I mean, these are smart. Yes. Yes. They're doing this whole thing. And then it may be that they go to their doctor and say, I think I'm autistic. And the doctor says, do you have a problem with eye contact? And they say no, because they don't have a problem with the system. Right. It means they don't have a problem. Same with social contact. I don't have a problem. I have a system. Exactly. God, the most autistic thing ever. <laughs> I don't have a problem. I have a system. I have a system for my socks. I have a system for my food. I have a system for eye contact. I don't yes. have a problem. Yeah. Social conversation. I have a whole mm-hmm. Rolodex of scripts for social conversation that I'm prepared. Absolutely. Some of the yes. people I work with, when they find out from talking to me that neurotypical people never think about eye contact never plan social conversations. We just wing it all the time. We're ad-libbing. It stuns me. Yep. It it has stunned many people. It's like, Mm -hmm. and then it's like, I've been working so much harder than everyone else. You know, it's exhausting. Oh my God. Yes. Masking is just exhausting. It's what they tell me. I am in the neuro majority, but Uh I have known and worked with and loved and lived with so many autistic people that yeah, I feel like the Jane, no, Jane Goodall. Would that be insulting? The Jane Goodall? Still, yeah, agree. <laughs> I like Jane Goodall. Um, yes, but agree. I've met her. I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I've met Jane Goodall. I have to say it because when else will somebody bring this up? Yep, carry on. <laughs> I, am, I am so impressed. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I met her while I was in college. Um, it was like 10 years ago now, as Facebook likes to remind me. She's completely fantastic. She actually has face uh, face blindness, but she's a really, really interesting person, as you might um, imagine. I do. I, I know. Can oh, so she's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, you are so lucky. I am just in awe. Thank you. I have just lived the most absurd and wild life. It's it's just been so great and fun. I can't remember what we were talking about. I guess masking. <laughs> Um, yes, but it's we're talking about how costly energy-wise masking yeah. can be. 
Exactly. Yes. And I've known some women who were not only masking all day at work, but then they would come home to their husbands and kids and continue to mask, trying to be the perfect wife and the perfect mother. And, you know, it's like the road to a nervous breakdown. It's just... Oh, of course it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, when you're trying to do something so exhausting 24-7, it's just mm -hmm. hard. So yeah. knowledge, knowing that there is nothing wrong with you. You've just been autistic all along. Um, yes. And that's okay. Yeah. And for mm -hmm. you, if you, you know, you sh should say no to social engagements that you don't really want to go to. <laughs> right. You should right. just be able to say right. no. And sometimes yes. there's yeah. going to be something you do want to go to. You know, somebody you really care about mm -hmm. is going to get married or graduate and you want to be there. Mm -hmm. So plan. Yes. Get your escape mm -hmm. route. <laughs> You know, yes. how much time yes. you're going to where you're going to be. Is there a place you can deck out and be alone and just breathe? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and that you might leave early, you know, tell the host, you know, if I have to leave early, thank you so much. It was a wonderful blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then plan for maybe however long it takes, maybe two days of nothing. Right. And right. To just stay in right. bed for, you know, because mm -hmm. that is so much. And it shows how mm -hmm. much you love that person if you if you go through that for their wedding or their baptism or their you know graduation whatever it is. Yes. That's it's right. A, it's a it's a gift of love, and then you it need is a gift to, of love. Yes, and you need to give yourself the gift of recovery time that is planned and on the calendar. Yes, you're so right. And food, bring your own food. Pre prepare your emergency food because it's going to be new food when you go to that thing, and you should probably if you're hungry and dealing with that, it's going to be worse. Absolutely. Yes. Agree. Food you plan. Very important. If you need like a little, <laughs> uh, I have some little like loop ear plugs where you can sit. I just oh my God. Them. I love my loops. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Most of are too loud. Loop plug. They're these little tiny ear plugs that you can put in and they have like different ranges on how much you want to be able, how much noise you want to be able to get through. I have them. My partner has them. We have some for my son who's an eight year old. That's how we got through Disney World. Yep. Yes. Agree. Yes. Uh, yeah. And if for a neurotypical person, the movie theater is the only place I have really needed them. But I need yes. them there. I was really loud. And I like to go to the mm. movies. Oh, yeah. By myself. Yes. When there's nobody else there, like the first show of the of the day. Mm -hmm. On a school day. And a yeah. Day. Um, yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Peopling costs energy. Absolutely. Yes. People and I love people. I am, I am like, I love people. My hyper focus is people. Human behavior is like the thing that my brain tinkers on constantly, but it's, it's costly. People cost a lot of energy. I agree. Yeah. So yeah. you have such great experience, both as, as an educator and somebody who has just been in the field of neurodiversity and observing how it grows over, you know, most of my lifetime and in most of your lifetime. So yes. what would you say is the uphill battle that you are or were constantly fighting? I think the uphill battle is identification or diagnosis for someone yes. who has been masking. And back when I was working in the schools, um, they used to, the districts would have to like pay more if we identified kids with a lot of special needs or that needed a lot of special help. Right. And, um, so sometimes right, right, they would right. say, yeah, so it's like, you're over-identifying. And it's like, we're really good at identifying. <laughs> and wow. we only test the kids that the district sent to us because they suspect autism. Right. You know, we were the autism assessment team. We're not testing right. all your kids. Right. But the ones who are right, right, right. teachers, they're autistic, they come to the team. And more, than, more of them than not are autistic because that's why they came to us. And because my team was really good at identifying them, we had good tools, you know, we, right. And, and now most of the people who come to our practice are autistic um, because they have self-selected. Yeah. They are, they've been self-diagnosing. They've been, yeah. they've found their way to you finally. And wow. they're smart. We still have yes. to do the whole thing and do all the testing. It, the, right. Now I have right. written some, some assessment tools, some questionnaires, because mm -hmm. so many of the tests are, well, most of them are for children. And right. of the ones for adults, many of them are kind of skewed to a, a male population. And most of the people who come to us are women, non-binary, trans, um, all kinds of people. And just yes. 
men as well. You know, we, we don't turn them right, away. Right. But we just right. get a lot of women and non-binary and trans. Right. Um, wow. So, so I have written a series of questionnaires that kind of gets behind the mask. Yeah. Um, they're not yet published. So right now they're, we're just using them in-house. But at some point right. they will be available. Um, but you need to be able to ask the, the questions. Now, I will yes. say in, in my book, Recognizing Autism in Women and Girls, um, there right. are questions in there for, you know, for professionals to ask in order to get behind the mask. In every chapter, there's, here's some, you know, here's some ways you might ask that. So instead of saying, right, uh, are you okay with eye contact? You might say, did you mm. teach yourself eye contact? You know, mm. I'm saying, mm. do you understand social interactions? You might say, right. Um, are you never quite sure if someone is flirting with you or just being friendly? You know, can you tell? Okay. That's the one I don't you? get. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the one. No, see, like I am like, I can, I'm so good at human behavior that I can predict human behavior in like almost all scenarios and settings, but whether someone is flirting with me or not, that's the one. That's the one I never, I never got any experience. Of. I have no it idea. <laughs> and most people don't know why they know, you know, it's like, how do they yes. tell? Um, no. Two of the books, no. two of the books in my Adulting While Autistic series are Dating While Autistic and um, oh, Relating man, that's While Autistic awesome. for couples that are already in couples. Yeah. And, and, you know, so well, cool. Well, we're on the topic because I love writing my books. That's fun for me. One of the things that I do that's the most fun for me is I have um, fictional characters that I make up. And mm -hmm. uh, then for every chapter, it's like, here's the topic of this chapter. Then for each of these, maybe five to seven characters, um, I say, this is how this character responded to this issue or this challenge and uh, right. what, what was hard for them and what it's they so did to overcome it. So important. Yes. And you not relate to all of those, but maybe one of them you will. And, um, mm -hmm. and and also, and I, I love those. Some of them have gone like from, from the dating book to the relating book to the parenting while autistic book. Right. Um, That's I love, amazing. I don't want to, I don't want to lose them. You don't want to lose the character. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's there a series was... now. <laughs> we need to know what happens to these people. That's, you know, that's, that's awesome. the way I feel about them. I was so happy when yeah. the couple in, in the dating while autistic, that's the one book that only has two fictional people because I was kind of following this couple. And then at the end mm -hmm. they met and they fell in love. And I was so happy right. when that happened. It they just, should. It, yes. And my daughter says, you know, you wrote that to be that way. Mm -hmm. And that was mm -hmm. the plan at the beginning of the book. I said, yes, yeah. but then it really happened. But then it really happened. Yeah. And uh, you blew my mind a little bit back. And I, I just, I want to like, pull you back to this for a second, because when you said that your team was diagnosing more autism and your feedback was that they're diagnosing, you're diagnosing too many kids as autistic because it costs the school money, that kind of stunned me a little bit. And I've been sitting here a little tiny bit stunned that whole time trying to think about like, oh my God, of course that's having an impact. Of course that's having a huge impact in who's getting their diagnoses, especially as the states and the schools there have less and less money to to be performing these diagnoses but but being forced to do so by law. So that's that's incredible. Okay. Okay. So that's that's stunning and I needed to sit with that for a second. Um and then the thing that I want to ask you next is why are the labels important? This is the this is one of the questions that I get and I have my own opinion. So I'm curious about your opinion. You were saying that the diagnosis is one of the most uphill battles you fight. So why do you feel that that ability to self-identify, that ability to have that diagnosis, why are the labels so important to our community? Yeah, and unfortunately, I think it uh now that's kind of two two issues. For the community yes. of autistic people to be able to find your people and find your friends and fall in love and whatever, if you if you want to be yes. accepted, you kind of you don't want to have that imposter syndrome. You want to feel like I right. really am one of you. Um, right now, from the, the autistic, right yeah. from the other point of view, for um, for like services 
and schools. Mm. It is unfortunate that there is not enough money to do everything that has to be done. Yes. And at the level of the teachers who are working with the kids and recognizing problems and saying, this child might be autistic, they need extra help. Um, right. It, it's very clear. And they appreciate it because right. the teachers, they know. But at some they know. level, much higher up where they have to, they only have, the people who have the purse strings only have so much money. Schools yes. are poor. And they, yes. they're required to do a lot of things of which they don't have enough money. So, yeah. so they can say, um, suddenly there's too many people being identified because now we have a team at the county to, to do that. Whereas right. before we didn't have anybody. Wow. Um, so wow. It, it's hard. And, and I feel for them. Because you can't of make course. money out of I mean, the air. <laughs> of course. So yeah. funding is at issue. It can't be that we, di we don't diagnose kids, right? It can't be that we don't provide services. It's that we need more funding to do those things. So, gosh, when I, my child is ADHD, right? So um, my eight-year-old. And mm -hmm. when we went, so we had had him diagnosed by a child psychologist while we were in the pandemic, which was not easy. It was, and I live in Massachusetts, so it was the best it could have been. But like, mm -hmm. it was not easy, first of all, to get the services. It was not easy to find someone who could do the diagnosis. It was, it was not easy to find someone who could work with him. In fact, the, um, the doctor that we ended up working with had come had returned from retirement just because the need was so great. And when we ultimately were able to get him his diagnosis, the school was like, hey, we got to do our own diagnosing. Sorry, you've got to go through the entire program again. And at That's the sick. end of it, it turned out they were like, oh, no, he definitely fits this criteria, but he doesn't qualify for an IEP because it's not impacting his intelligence. Mm. I okay. know that was the, that was the answer. I stood, this is, this was my face right to my face. That I said that. <laughs> well, I, I so, just want to say I mean, there, yeah. there, ha there have been court cases where just because an autistic child gets good grades, if they are not right okay socially, and if they need special help right. in the social realm, that that is important and that therefore of course. school districts are obligated. But the first that's right. Because again, they are trying to say we only have so much money. If we only if have so much money, right? Aids and they're not getting in trouble, then we're not right. going to serve. Them. If they actually need help, and maybe they don't need help right now, but they will in the future. But if they right. need help with social right. skills, um, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's talking to a a speech pathologist about, um, you know, pragmatics or right. a counselor about right. whatever it is not your child, but if a child gets in right. trouble because they did something that in their mind, it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. Right. Yeah. To right. to have the, the compassion and understanding of, Oh, this is an autistic child. And right. Right. If you look at it through their eyes, it didn't make sense. Right. Right. And his school has been God, you know, God bless them. I have been so lucky. His school has been great. They've been accommodating. Like his okay. teacher is phenomenal. She is just like in love with that, him. And she, he, you know, he is in love with her. I am pouring no short amount of energy into the system or, or into the schools. I'm there all the time volunteering and we are wrapping him in as many services as possible. But I'm I just, I work, not everybody's <clears throat> me, right? Like I'm, I'm, I do this, like not everybody is me. How do you think as an expert that we go about getting more funding for these types of programs when it is so obvious that it's needed? And I'm thinking it comes down to uh, voting, to voting at, not only for the president, but also at the local, but at every level where there is a vote to be made to look at right. what that party or that person, what is their, what is their history been about education? And funding yes. education, because great, the problem great. with special education is there is more that is required and mandated than that is funded. And right. yet when, when they have to pull wow. from the general education fund, they, they call it, you know, um, I can't remember the term they use because I've been out of education so long, but it makes it sound like, well, you're taking, it's like you're stealing from the general ed kids, not literally. Right. There's right. that feeling. It's like, wow. we have to do this, you know. 
right. if it were possible to get the right people in the right, however yeah. high you have to go to, to be where the money starts to sift down right. at the state level, um, right. to be able to fund special education to the level, wow. to, to the same degree that it is mandated, because right now it is not encroachment. That's what they call it. That special ed encroaches on the general ed budget, but special ed is mandated. And, you know, right. What can anyone do? So there is more that is mandated than is funded. That yeah. is a, that is a startlingly succinct description of the problem. That is fascinating. No, nope, yeah. you're absolutely right. And of course, you okay. can see the pain on both sides. It's not right. that the of people course. holding the I don't strings blame are the mean. teachers. I'm, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not blaming the teachers. I don't worry about no. the teachers. The teachers are fantastic. Teachers are right. They're doing as much as they can with what they have. How long can we continue to basically assume that teachers will bear this on their backs as long as they can and the students will just not get what they need? Like, it's just... It's not even just a broken system. It's, it's, is it, in, I don't want to say intentional, but like, if we know that this isn't working for as long as we've known it isn't working, at what point does it become intentional, right? At what point does our ignorance become intentional malice, you know? Um, that's a great segue for this question that I have for you. In, okay. So I wanted to know, in what ways are our schools and educators more informed now about neurodiversity than perhaps they ever have been? Well, I have been out of the school since 2016. I do only adults, right. now, but as of well, 2016, you're still getting you're still getting that though, right? <laughs> you're still de yeah. still dealing with um, hurt kids that became adults for sure. That became adults, exactly. And maybe that's another myth: is that autism is a childhood thing? Mm. Um, but yes, it's, it's not. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. But as my career went forward, I was called upon as the, the autism, you know, expert. Um, right. I, right. One never thinks of oneself as an expert because there are so many other people. It's like Temple Grandin. Is an Dunning expert. Kruger. Yes. Yeah. I always say that and people don't get it. They're like, but, but you do it. And I'm like, right. But anybody who does it knows how much more there is to know and knows yeah. they can't know most of it. Yes, yeah. absolutely. But Absolutely. In, in my county, I was being called upon and happy to do trainings for school psychologists and for um, mm -hmm. teachers and for administrators. And um, yes, even after I retired, I was um, uh, brought back in, flown back down to California to for a district that I hadn't worked for, but to just do a full like four days. We saw everybody. We did a, right. a training for the lunch ladies. We did a training for the bus drivers. We did trainings for, we even brought in outside um, the uh, uh, emergency, you know, fire and mm -hmm. police, sure, yeah. if anybody yeah. they wanted to send. Um, the EMTs. To just spread, yeah, the EMTs of what autism is and how it might look different. You know, it's like if yes. you are, yes. if you're looking for a lost child out in the forest, because this was in a mountain region, um, mm -hmm. they might not come to you if you call their name. They might hide further. But if you have like a, right. you can play on the phone, on your phone, the song of their favorite TV show and turn it up really loud and hold that yes. phone out. You're much more likely to find that child. Even if they're nonverbal, you figure right. out what, what do they want and you do that. Right. Right. So, so I think we're, I th it seemed to me at that time that we were doing more and more training of more people. I don't know if that's universal. Right. Right, but in right. the little corner of California, we were doing our best. Right, right. Wow, that's incredible. That's incredible that you're doing that work. I, I'm so grateful. So you're a parent of neurodivergent children. In Was your experience helpful to your parenting? To a certain extent, but more than that was uh, that their dad was autistic, even though we didn't right. know that. Right. At the time, you know, you just fall in love. You don't, right? You, you don't know, right? But um, you didn't I know at the time, out, right? Yeah, I found out later that he had given them advice. You know, like a father would advise their child. Mm -hmm. That was, um, you know, if you look at the point between someone's eyes, they they assume that you look at their <laughs> eyes and they don't have to. And they, it's like they were all right. Like, oh yeah, yeah, that's good advice. And I'm when I heard neurodivergent that, I like, code, really. I never even thought of that. 
Um, now, my one neurotypical daughter is very much bilingual. <laughs> she, and, and I right. think I am too. Right. But <laughs> if I miss something, she will, you know, point it out. You know, it's like you, right. you can't ask her another question because she will break. <laughs> right. But, Right. Oh, so true. So true. I would say in my family, um, because both of my kids are neurodivergent, my partner's autistic, and I am clearly ADHD. So what we do in our family is we sort of, we have a language of advocacy, right? So we are constantly over explaining ourselves and over explaining our, and like apologizing to our kids oh. when we don't quite have all the spoons um, and all of those mm. sorts of things. And sometimes when I'm having to lay in bed because I'm completely burnt out, I will be sitting in the dark and, you know, my eight-year-old will come by and be like, are you sick? And I'm like, no, buddy, you know, I'm just, I'm just burned out. My, you know, I use too many of my spoons and I just, I don't, I don't have enough left. So I have to sort of lay here in the dark and, you know, not be overstimulated. And then I found out from his teacher that he's like, his class is neurodiversity expert and he's constantly like sharing at circle time new things that he learned about himself. And I figured like, oh. wow, how much different is it going to be for him and for her knowing just that they can talk to their friends about it or knowing that they can just like advocate for themselves? How much better are they going to do just with like a completely different experience than you or I even had? I, I'm just, I'm so, I'm so grateful to live in this time with our kids, you know? Yes. Whew. That is so, wonderful. Yeah. You mentioned spoons and I think Thank spoons you. great. My, my middle daughter who is not, she is neurotypical, neuromajority, but physically mm -hmm. she is a spoony big time. So she taught us all spoon language and, uh, really? and you, you can awesome. get it, you know, because we all, you know, if you're, if you're autistic, it might be social spoons or sensory spoons. Right. And, sensory you know, I'm spoons. 70. So, so most of the time yeah. I think of myself as the, the strongest, most powerful of the four of us. Um, right. And other times I think, but you know what? I'm 70. Right. <laughs> and maybe right. somebody else can do that thing. Um, totally. Totally. And of course they can. And when your kids are adults, there's much more um, of them doing things for each other and for me. And and I, I love it when it's like, you know, my, my daughter will say, oh, I can help, you know, it's like, oh, so-and-so mm -hmm. got a jury summons. Okay. Just give me the paper and I'm going to take care of it. Um, oh. Whether it's getting them signed up or getting them, you know, yeah. uh, released from it, uh, whatever it is. And because right. she has the, the neurotypical brain. Right. And she does and and she deal has, with that stuff. You know, and she has brain spoons. But right. it just is to see them interacting with each other. And the two that are autistic have different skills and strengths. And it's like, right, I can do this for you. And then you can do that for me. Right. And, um, it's a great feeling to see them, you know, yeah, uh, not needing me as much. And of course they still That's, need me. But, of course. But, but they, they need you for different things. Right. Yeah. Right. In my house, so my partner's autistic, as I said, and I'm ADHD, so I will forget to feed myself. I won't drink my water for several hours. I will, and then I'll wonder why I feel terrible, right? Like I, I just, like I won't eat or drink or, and I've had two cups of coffee. My partner will come downstairs and he'll be like, did you eat? And I'll be like, no. And he'll be like, are you hungry? I'm like, no, 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 I don't eat anything. And he'll just put some food in front of me and then I'll eat it, right? And my kids are the same way. He's on the opposite end of make sure you feed yourself. I'm putting food in front of you. I'm making sure your water's full. And like, I do all our peopling. So he hates social situations. He hates being on the phone. He hates dealing with that stuff. So I deal with all our that stuff. And he deals with all of our keeping us alive stuff. <laughs> it, it so yeah, me of, absolutely. Well, yeah. My husband, I was the one that went out and did the work because I loved my yep. job and it gave good benefits. And he was, yes. the one, he was also a writer. But he was also the stay-at-home right. parent, you know, and he would. Mm -hmm. just, that happens, yeah. Yeah, bring me a cup we of tea. We find our opposites in the world. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. You know what? I definitely wanted to ask you. I don't want to like let you go before I ask you this. So I get a lot of feedback from older people usually that there didn't used to be so many um, autistic persons or um, you know ADHDers in the world. And this is all just a new thing to get accommodations and all of that. What is your response as somebody who was actually there? 
I, I can't, I mean, I obviously know what I say, but, but what would you say to that as somebody who was there a little bit more sooner than I was? How about that? Yeah, I've, I've been around it a while and I've, you know, read some <laughs> of the history. Uh, there's a couple right. things. Uh, one is um, because many autistic people also have intellectual disability. And yes. for most of the time, once they had that label, of uh, what they used to call mental retardation, mm. nobody looked for a secondary label. You know, it's like, oh, right. they they they're intellectually disabled, and so then they have all these quirks because of that, right? Um, and they didn't even look beyond that. Um, right. And you know, a lot of families have, oh, uncle so and so was eccentric, you know, or eccentric, right? Eccentric. There was a lot of people that were right. eccentric. Uh, I am eccentric. Uh, or, you know, <laughs> just didn't like right. people, but they didn't label it. Right. If they were more functional. Right. And um, wow. another right. thing is, we know that it's a, uh, it's a genet. There is a genetic component. Right. And, um. So right. I, I married an autistic man. Didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And I probably, mm -hmm. you know, you talk about an eccentric uncle. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think if I go back far enough in my own family. I can find, you know, my dad's uncle. If you're yes. hearing about, you know, the the eccentric uncle, um, and the one eccentric of my, video. yeah, it's like you know, yep. probably my kids got it from both sides, right? And so many people with, you know, what they would call, you know, high functioning, which is a, mm -hmm. a useful term, you know, the functional right. labels are just, I can't even say them without the finger quotes, right? But able is what they are, yeah, yeah for sure. Autistic people are often drawn to certain careers, maybe um, mm -hmm. from Valley. Uh, yes. And there yes. they will, they will meet other people like them exactly. and they will <laughs> fall in love and they will get married and they will have children. And those children mm -hmm. are getting it from both sides. Absolutely. And yep. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Temple Grandin. Yes. She once said that um, if it weren't for autistic people, we'd all still be sitting in caves, socializing around the fire. And nobody would get stuff Bless done. God. Yes. I wonder yeah. about that all the time. I think I said that to you before I even started recording. Like, I wonder about, like, if the world was less itchy and bright and loud, if if you know, there would be more of us just in leadership positions. Being, yes. Because you see the problem solving and the tinkering and the perfectionism yes. and the obsessiveness about facts and and hyper awareness about things and you're just like oh my gosh how yeah, how is that point. that is yeah. marketable of course yeah. right no and i mean yeah. i i do work for um tech and biotech spaces and i'll get feedback that people will be like oh well we know ted is autistic but there aren't any other people like that why do you do that in these fields and it's like because all of you are all of you are it's not like it's not like just ted who doesn't like to go to meetings we see it at like 20 to 25 percent or more in these tech and biotech spaces. So that's why I live there because I'll just, I'll start a conversation and I'll be like, okay, fine. None of you have neurodiversity. Quick question. Which one is your favorite silverware utensil and why is it Little Spoon? How about, how much do you hate big light? Your entire house is soft lighting. Like that's how I start off all of these conversations because people yeah. will always be like, Oh, is that what it is? It's that, you know, like I even even in these brilliant spaces, you've got people solving human scale problems of tech and biotech. And, you know, the, we we still don't think of ourselves as as potentially being, um, you know, neurodivergent. And, and you you're so right. Sadly, the, the gatekeeper often is the job interview. Yes. You know? The next book I'm, well, I the next book I, I just signed a contract for is working while autistic. Um, I haven't started yes. writing it yet because I'm still working on the the second edition of the first one in the series. But um, yes, the job interview. Temple Grandin never had a single job interview. People would just, you know, she had no. a portfolio. And people would yeah. say, "Look, just hire her. Just hire her." You know, yeah, because she was really, right. really good at her job, but she could not yes. do a job interview. That's yes. so social. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We also fall prey to what we call the neurodivergent um, employment cycle. 
people will be really pumped to hire us or they'll be like filling a quota to hire us or they'll be any number of things and they'll they'll come to us as experts or or things like that and then we will learn everything there is to know about that role and you know all of the all of the rules about it all of the you know important bits about it and then we'll start asking questions that people kind of don't want to answer and then we sort of become a problem for certain managers and it's like each person's experience is so so close to that where they go from that like people are interested in in sort of air quotes unlocking our genius to the oh no we didn't mean like that you know what i mean and that yes, sort of seems like to be that. everybody yes exactly not like that mm -hmm. we didn't really want you to solve those problems we wanted yeah. you to solve the things that we thought were problems yes the ones we're comfortable exactly with. the not things the that we're comfortable changing not yeah. the things that are actually the problem yes exactly yeah. so many of us fall victim to that exactly I look forward to that book. I cannot wait to hear more about it because it has been definitely something that has been um, burdening a lot of people in my community for a very long time. So I look forward to that. Well, oh my goodness. Yes. Okay. So before I get off on another tangent with you, Wendy, because I swear you have been such a fun conversation this morning and I feel like it could go on and on forever. Like I need to let you get back to your life. So, um, I'm sure everyone would love to hear more about how they can follow you and get in touch and, and find your books. How can they best do that? Okay. Well, if you're interested in my books, it's uh, my website is my name, Wendell of com. And mm -hmm. if you're mm -hmm. interested in the uh, adult autism assessment or other services, counseling, life coaching, um, that's adult autism com. So pretty Perfect. simple. If you want to and, email um, me, you can email me at drwendy at adultautism.com and just tell me that this is where we met so that I will, perfect. I will know who you are. Perfect. And Wendy has sent me those links and they are going to be below in the show notes if you'd like to connect so that if you didn't quite catch that, that's where they'll be. You can find her right there. Y'all, thank you for tuning in today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to the Indomitable podcast for more incredible stories of humaning. Remember, my book, Indomitable, a foster care story is available everywhere you get your books and currently has five stars on Goodreads. So thank you to all my indomitable friends who came out to visit me at my book signing last week. It is always so rewarding to be able to see people impacted by my story and sharing their journeys. If you have events you'd like me to bring the indomitable experience to, please submit a request via my website at dicerulo.com. And finally, as ever, I am so happy to have you here in community with me. And remember, together we are truly indomitable. Have a great week, everybody.